Well, good morning, everybody. Excellent. Um, as I saw on the program there, uh, welcome and keynote Peter Boyd. And I thought, gee, I'm, I'm welcoming you. Uh, I'm, I'm a very new arrival here, so it was great that Stuart opened, the, opened with words there. I feel very welcome. Um, I just moved here from uh, London in July last year to Westport, so a local resident and introduced to the great community that is Yale. So very new and, uh, as I say, I feel very welcome. Um, in terms of this morning, I don't want to take too much of your time because I'm excited, as everyone else, I think, to get into the, into the business plans. But what I thought I'd do is, these, is, is this little equation. Uh, after a quick bit of context and caveats, um, Three, three real little stories from my recent past in terms of solving climate change um, and making money at the same time. Um, some trends that I'm excited about, um, and then closing on sort of roles that we could all take uh, leaving this room, because I think it's always exciting to come to a day like this and together, and then actually do something different uh, when we all leave. Um, so in terms of the context, uh, first, first off, um, I'm looking up to you actually. Uh, I was looking at the business plans and, and I'm a new entrepreneur, as Stuart said. I mean, entrepreneurial, I think, is the adjective for, for quite, quite a few years, but an entrepreneur for just a few months. So I'm looking up at you saying, gosh, you're ahead of me. You've got customers. Uh, some of you got funders. Um, you're, you're ahead. So, so, so that, that's a quick bit of caveat. Um, uh, the other piece is the context of climate change. Um, you know, sort of, I, you know, we, we can get quite depressed, but, but on the other hand, it's just worth sort of setting how urgent and real the problem is. Um, I've just updated, I keep updating my slides every so often, you know, sort of different events and things like that, and go, geez, just yesterday in, in, in climate progress, you probably, some of you already follow that, um, new records, uh, January to March was the hottest three months uh, ever uh, of any, any year recorded in a calendar year. But interestingly, the rolling 12 months, uh, the, the so April to March, is the hottest 12 months ever. The, uh, what would have it, March to February was the hottest 12 months ever, and the, and, and the, and, and the, and the rolling 12 month before that. So basically, we're sort of continually breaking records on, on temperature. You, it, well, the irony will not uh, sort of escape you, obviously. The one piece of blue is exactly where we are today. Um, so we can, I can drop a snowball here and say, look, it doesn't exist. Um, but, um, but, 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 but there it is. Um, I, and I think everyone here, the, the great thing about um, um, CBA, which I was, I was very impressed with, is, is bringing business and environment to, uh, together. And so it's the multi-connected impacts of climate change as well. GDP arguably is a 1.5% hit to GDP already. Uh, people are forecasting a 3% hit to GDP if, if, we, if we don't address it. Worse, though, is the 11% hit to the developing world. So as always with all these things, it's the, it's, it's the poorest that are going to get hit the hardest. And, and talking about that, the interconnected impacts, 22 million is the number of climate change displaced uh, migrants in 2013, according to the UN, which is more than double uh, those that were displaced by conflict. So it's just like there's just a number of different pieces here when we're talking about climate change. People call it threat multiplier and various other descriptors, but it's just, it, it, you know, it is serious, and I think we all know that in the room. It's just always worth uh, keeping that in mind. The other piece on the business context, many of you might have seen this if you've seen this at Do the Math and Bill McKibben and Carbon Visuals. It, I just quite like this one because it's just like there's the global carbon dioxide we created uh, up to the Industrial Revolution. There's the man-made carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now, and we've got that little red line um, another thing has 500 gigatons or something just to burn, and then that's us in our two degree threshold, uh, according to science. Um, unfortunately, that top half is, 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 is sort of the unburnable bit, but it's actually two and a half, giga, uh, two and a half thousand gigatons of people's balance sheets of proven reserves of fossil fuels. So there's a real business problem here. Um, <clears throat> and, and then I thought I'd also give you a, a sort of bang up to date slide, which is the good news. Uh, and Michael Liebrich in another hall slightly bigger than this uh, in New York was just presenting at the start of the week saying, look, just, but just look here, in terms of global additions, uh, renewables in 2013 actually turned the curve and are adding more than oil, gas and coal. And just look at the trends. And I like the way that he color made it nice and colorful on the, on the good side. <laughs> And dirty and gray and black on the on, on the dirty side, just to emphasize, uh, you know, sort of what was happening there. So, just if, I think that's quick context is essential. Just to say like it's big, it's happening, it's real, it's urgent, and, and I think we're all there already in the room. So, from then on, so a couple of stories I think to sort of get us going in terms of well, can we actually solve this uh, on on the uh, on the left side of the cost curve? Can we make money and save the environment at the same time? Um, quick hands up, uh, everyone familiar with the cost curve? Yeah, lots of nods. Don't need, don't need, anyone not? There's one, there's one, if it's only one, we're gonna chat to you afterwards um, it, for the sake of speed. Um, but basically, uh, the stuff on the left, as Stuart said in the intro, is the stuff that gets you along carbon dioxide mitigation, 
um, and is also negative cost, uh, i.e. somebody somewhere is making money. And I'm gonna do bucket one is go efficient, which basically means using less of the stuff that is dirty and getting more expensive um, and is harder to get. So go efficient is using less of, less of whatever that stuff is. Um, example, example in, in Carbon War Room, um, as, as Stuart said, it's, it was an, it's an NGO started by entrepreneurs, by, by entrepreneurs and business people, so hardly any of the, there's, there's always a sort of a for-profit background went into it, saying, well, where are these, these places where we could do this, make money and, and, and solve climate at the same time, but it's not happening for some market failure reasons. And the most intriguing place we found is actually the maritime shipping industry. Um, and maritime shipping industry, 100,000 ships in the world, transporting 95% of the world's goods. So it's, it's a very concentrated industry, and it's a very po polluting one by necessity, by its size. It's actually the sixth largest country in the world if it was a country. So that's one, one billion tons of CO2 uh, from, uh, from 100,000 ships. Um, socks, knocks, and particulate matters, it's, 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 a, it's a worse story. Um, one large ship, one of the largest ships in the world is 50 million cars worth. So, so uh, 15 of the largest ships in the fleet is the entire world stock of cars right now in sulfur dioxide terms, just 15. And it's quite a lot more than that in the port of New York, New Jersey, just right now. Um, <clears throat> but the exciting piece is um, there's so many technologies that could actually go onto a ship right now. Uh, the sort of the technical people in the room, you sort of, this is actually quite exciting. Anything from the new wind technologies, <laughs> Um, boring but effective, the top left-hand corner, just the best paints in the world, save 10% fuel. Um, there's some exciting stuff, middle left, where you force air bubbles underneath the hull, and, uh, and that's ball, effectively ball bearings and, and reduces the friction. Um, and then waste heat recovery and some, some stuff that those that are in the building uh, trade would, would, would recognize as building efficiency. So the key piece here is this, like, well, what's happening? Why is there um, effectively 50, 60 technologies that could be saving fuel and could be saving money, and then therefore uh, sort of pollution and carbon, but aren't being, uh, aren't, aren't being affected onto the ships of today. And it came down to two key market failures. One is poor information. It was hard to tell a clean ship from a dirty ship in the fleet, whether you were on the demand side and you said, I want my goods only on clean ships, uh, or the most efficient, and on your supply side, it's saying like, my ship is better than the rest, hire me, not, 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 that, not that one. The second one is one that, again, familiar in the building trade, is the landlord-tenant market failure. 70% of the fuel in the shipping uh, trade, it turns out, is paid for by the cargo owner, not by the ship owner. So then, if you've, you are a ship owner and you're rational, then you know, sort of, why would I put all those technologies on the previous slide on my ship? My capital cost is higher, um, and somebody else will then get the benefit of the lower fuel bill. And because of the first market failure of poor information, nobody can tell if I've done it or not anyway, really. So because of these two very persistent market failures, it wasn't policy failures, it's market failures, this wasn't happening. So then this is where Carbon Warren thought, this is really interesting, there's money to be made here, and there's carbon to be saved at the same time, this is left side stuff. Um, let's ju jump into action. So the first thing we did is we borrowed uh, a few things and put them all together. We borrowed the A to G rating from the EU and said, can, you know, it's been applied to fridge freezers, it's been applied to apartments and cars, why can't it be applied to ships? Um, then there's the Energy Efficiency Design Index from the IMO. They were actually developing a new design index for, for new ships, but it, no reason why it shouldn't be applied to all ships. Um, and then the other piece was a database of all the numbers you get when a ship is made. Um, and you can actually mash it all together. And what we created is it's a, 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 was effectively, that is the screen grab, shippingefficiency.org. So this is still live right now. You can put any name of any ship on the active fleet, and up pops the rating, is it an A, is it a B, is it a C, or, or is it a G? So that's the first thing, was trying to get the information moving around the, around the system. The second piece was then not necessarily to nudge policymakers, even though some of the times we got called in by policymakers into the room, but then saying, well, well what actually, who's actually going to pull this through? And the most interesting people to pull it through are people like Cargill. Cargill and basically the big charterers, they've got fuel bill, the cargo in particular, two to three billion dollars a year. So somebody is, 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 is paying for an awful lot of fuel so they can start effectively picking A's and, and shedding G's. And that's exactly what Cargill did. We are buried in the fifth or sixth paragraph of the Financial Times article because we weren't important. The important thing was that Cargill was moving and taking the market with it. Um, and that's really, and, and then the, sec, the third piece was the capital. So once we got the pinch, which was effectively um, the information exists 
and, um, and, and, and uh, the buyers were then moving across and up, and up the scale, starting to buy the entrepreneurs. Um, entrepreneurs are not dissimilar to people in this room. They're making that little bit of kit, the bit of software that makes uh, the ship go best through a storm or whatever it is. They're now buying those entrepreneurs and demanding that, pulling that through because uh, they, don't, they want to buy A's in the, in the fleet. The third piece is effectively the money, and that's the finance mechanism. It's all very well if the ship, ship owner feels pinched and says, geez, I need to get this to be hired. I need to be an efficient ship to be hired, but I can't afford it. The next piece is importing a finance mechanism from the building trade, um, PACE financing and a few other things, and getting into the, ship into the shipping industry. So basically, the, sh the ship owner doesn't need to pay for an upgrade. Um, the technologies go on for free, the technology gets a customer, and then the uh, fuel pair effectively gets small savings in the short term and large savings in the long term. Um, just a quick update there, we, went to, we start nudging the ports as well, so Canadian ports then said, well, we'll give, um, we'll, we'll, we'll give incentives for A's, so actually get a carrot at the top end and a stick at the bottom end, uh, you're not hired. And now 30% of the non-container uh, buyers, the charters of this world, are now picking on A's to, A to G. Um, so that's just a piece of sort of like the, the economic opportunity about you sort of using less of the dirty stuff. I think the, the other really exciting thing on the left side of the cost curve, another bucket of entrepreneurial opportunity is, is using more or making more of the getting cheaper, more abundant and clean uh, side of the house, so go renewable. So really, it, it solving climate change in the entrepreneurial context is very much about going efficient and going renewable. In terms of that, um, a, a story in terms of we, that we are, are, are um, close to and actually uh, we're collaborating with, uh, with the magazine uh, here in Yale just recently is, is islands. Um, the interesting thing about islands and island nations in the Caribbean in particular is their cost curve looks nothing like this, the, the sort of the standard sketch one there. Effectively, because of importing diesel for electricity over long distances and putting them into effectively ship engines that don't move, uh, they happen to be called power stations in the islands, but effectively they're just big engines, um, their cost curve looks like there's a whole load of stuff in the green and underneath the x-axis and only a little bit in the red. They can switch to renewable right now because it's so expensive to do what they're currently they're currently doing. The other piece is that the, the, the technology solutions are getting ready for implementation now. There's some really exciting sort of cost declines on the solar side. And, um, uh, I heard about energy storage being, being mentioned as one of the alumni here. You know, so it's amazing technology leaps. They're just making this ready to happen. Um, and then the other piece, which is really interesting for those that are following the COP process and the geopolitical process going up to Paris and beyond, is that these island nations are ready to actually make a commitment and inspire the world. They can thump the table and say, not only are you going to sort of, uh, you're in danger of making me drown, uh, but actually, I can actually show you how to get there and how to transfer to a low carbon economy. Um, our guinea pig in this case uh, was Necker Island, Richard Branson's home. Um, you sort of, uh, let's try it out before we try it out on a, on a, on a quote on a real island or a democracy. Um, 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 so, so you get one guy that says, sure, uh, let's, let's give this a shot. Uh, so we actually open a, a request for proposal out and say, flip this island, the world. Uh, entrepreneurs, sharpen your pencils. Um, and if you do this and you win, then you get to have said that you flipped Necker Island off fossil fuels. Um, so that's what happened. Um, that's NRG winning with some quite inventive little sketches in terms of making solar beautiful as well as uh, making it functional. Um, from there to, to quotes, a real island and a democracy, Aruba. Um, we, we went with the, the, the Prime Minister of Aruba and are still working there in terms of creating a document and a pathway, how do they get to very high penetration renewables and then actually sort of enabling them to flip. Um, effectively, it became the 10 Island Challenge, challenged by the UN to do more. Um, and it's about creating a playbook effectively um, and saying this is, the, this is the journey that you take um, and that was really the market failure in, in islands. It was not so much the lack of will, but the lack of skill to, to sort of marshal this all through. Um, that's where we're working in the 10 Island Challenge. There's a carbon war room and, and RMI, the merger that Stuart just referred to, with uh, more islands on the way. So I think the entrepreneurial opportunities crudely, like without looking at policy, without looking at, at, at the politicians in general, is just like where are the go efficient opportunities, where are the go renewable? Using less of what's dirty and, and getting more expensive and harder to get at and, and less socially acceptable and going renewable. And, and, see, and the good thing about sort of the bipartisan piece here is we haven't mentioned the word climate change once. It's just about sort of making money here. The other piece that I just want to do is a third story, which is my more recent past. It's just a really interesting piece of the power of the collective voice. 
Um, and that's not, that works at different levels, but this is an interesting level, um, as you might agree if you look to the, at, at, at this bunch of people. This is the B team. So B team is, uh, is, is a better way of doing business. They've set themselves up and said, we'll stand together and, and stand for something better, not just across climate, but across climate people and, and, and governance. And so, uh, and even better than that, not only the 14 have gathered, but also under a coalition called We Mean Business. We've joined and co-founded that coalition. So really there's thousands of businesses now that are now starting in the, in the run up to Paris and you may have noticed some of these messages and beyond saying, this is what business thinks about the opportunity on climate change. So not just acting ourselves, but starting to be realizing the voice to actually change policy on a national and, and, and global basis. A quick example of that, which you may have seen, um, but we sort of spotted a moment as, as the B team where we, the, the, the leaders gathered in Davos, got quite excited in a, in, in a bad way, saying, geez, this is urgent, uh, and saw the slides that we, we, we all just saw at the start of the presentation, said we have to do something about this, um, and called for effectively a net zero emissions economy by 2050 that should go into the Paris Agreement. We timed this um, just before Christiana Figueres, who heads up the UNFCCC, was briefing the negotiators saying, okay, we're about to sit together in Bonn. Uh, now we've got to talk about the text. And then, oh, look what's in the Financial Times. And look what's in the Guardian. And so we timed it so that there was like a business call for an ambitious long-term target just before they were talking about it. This is very current, as, in, as, you, as anyone who's following this process knows. This is by no means um, a, slam, a slam dunk. This is no, we're, 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 we're very much still working on trying to get a long-term goal, ambitious, anchored into the agreement. So that's three stories in terms of how to get there, all about entrepreneurs, whether it's go efficient, go renewable, or actually collecting voices of entrepreneurs together and seeing what they can do. Uh, trends that I'm excited about. Um, and there's four Ps. Um, P, P1, the pretense is over. Um, there's been jokes about the flat earth society. This, the, I think, I think the sort of enlightened, you could call it sort of enlightened Republicans are starting to come through, but, but really it's just, it's a worldwide phenomenon now. We're kind of hopefully moving across this side sort of, is it happening or not? And we're starting to focus in a lot more places on what, what are the actual, what are the actual solutions? The other interesting thing is most of the time, and, and my, my last two or three jobs, it's, it's like you're not actually even needing to talk about climate change anyway. You're just talking about solutions and resource efficiency. But the pretense is largely over. I think the other P is pivot, pivot to opportunity. Even the cost curve, this is the McKinsey cost curve, ex-McKinsey guy myself. I love taking all the detail off it and made it, making it a very simple, uh, this is the actual McKinsey cost curve, uh, much, much more dense. Um, but the same guys, and actually is my first manager, who went to the new climate economy and wrote the big report, if, it's, it's, it's a great one if, if, if people uh, want, want, want some reading, the new climate economy. Um, but they pivoted the, 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 the table round and said, this is the marginal abasement benefit curve. And I just think even that small uh, change in language is a good idea because now the left side of the cost curve is still the thing to chase, but it's profit that we're chasing, not necessarily negative cost. So mar mar marginal abasement benefit curve. And, and it's, as, it's that pivot of costs. Um, really like the bipartisan approach to things like risky business, talking about, I think Hank, Hank Paulson said, you know, sort of doing nothing is actually an incredibly risky strategy. Um, and then also sort of moving into the language of infrastructure. And that's again what the new climate economy report did very well. I think $90 trillion needs to be invested in the next 15 years anyway. Do we want a, 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 high, a high carbon economy out of that 90 trillion or do we want a resilient uh, low carbon one? And it's kind of obvious in terms of if, if you're say, sitting there with your 90 trillion. Um, <clears throat> Um, the, 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 the other part of the pivot, I think, is on, on language. Um, I think we've lost a lot of people in the kind of, uh, probably look at this whole, whole room and say, right, we're in the environmental movement. We want the solution to happen. We've lost the people outside this room with talk of two degrees, with talk, is it, well, is 1.9 safe and is 2.1 lethal? You know, like, like we've, we've lost a lot of people on the, on the talk of degrees. We've lost even more people on talks of parts per million. What the hell's that? You know, sort of, we, we, we've, we've lost people. Whereas uh, what I quite like about zero and net zero is that people know what that means. They know what it means to have no impact on what they're doing. A very bipartisan thing, I think, is for instance, in America, is like a, is a campsite. You leave the campsite as you found it. Um, and that's a very much the net zero approach, whether it's across food, energy, water, resources. PepsiCo, for instance, I just heard there's a, there's a New Mexico um, factory that is net zero already on food, energy, oh, uh, sorry, not food, sorry, energy, water, and, and waste. Um, so I think there's a real pivot in language from things that people don't care about to things that people can get action on. I think the other nice thing about the pivot on language is a pivot from 
a burden to, to a race to the top. Why have I got a photo of stones on there? It's, it's the obvious piece, was, I think you've probably heard of this before, but we didn't move out of the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. There are still stones in the world. We're, we're gonna move on to the zero carbon economy, not because you know, sort of we've run out of oil. It's because there'll be a better, cheaper, cleaner way of doing things. Um, the third P is, is really interesting for business and entrepreneurs that are in this room, which is that people care more. Um, how many here um, made it down to New York in September? Oh, I see, that's, it's great going with students. Uh, you know, so three, but, but having said that, at the head of that, I don't know, you, you guys might have seen them, but the CEO of IKEA and the Chief Sustainability Officer of IKEA were in the front of the march. All the politicians, there were quite a few politicians there, so it was a, a people's march. But for those that were in the room, and I think there was like quarter to third, the, the, the phrase that really resonated with me was this one. I love the chant, this is what democracy looks like. Um, and it is that, and this democracy is not only the effect of this on the UN General Assembly and the COP, it's the democracy on people's wallets and brands. And, the, and, and people are walking away from brands that they don't like, that don't stand for this transition, and are walking to brands that do. Um, the last P is just is this idea of the problems enlarged. Um, I, lo I love the sort of the, the general trend, and we've seen it most in islands, about this idea of enlarging the problem in order to solve it. I love the Eisenhower quote there, is that if a problem cannot be solved, enlarge it. If you take the same island that I was talking about in Aruba, um, if you try and solve solar on its own, then you get to this place where the utility is saying, well, we can't have more than 30%, or we can't have this, and it stresses, it stresses the grid, et cetera. And then you have people on the electric vehicle side going, well, how are we gonna do this? Where's the charging stations? So, well, actually, take a step back, and then the, ele and the electric vehicles become your storage. And they can be supercharged, they can go around, and then they can be semi-uncharged, et cetera, and, and the, those in the room here, are, so, some of you might be even working on that, on, that, on that kind of grid stabilization stuff. But that's a classic example of taking a step back and solving the both together as a system. So there it is. Um, you probably haven't seen this diagram before, because it's, and you probably don't need it again. But just my idea in terms of like, as, as I look at the world of the environment, you know, sort of where are those trends that are interesting? I mean, the pretense is over. There's a pivot to opportunity. Um, there's people do care about this. They're voting uh, with both the election ballots, but also with their wallets. And, and it's about kind of enlarging the problem in order to solve it. So last piece, really, um, and, and, and then I'd love to sort of turn it over to all of you, all of you guys, is, is, you know, sort of what's our role, my role in, in, in all this? Um, first thing I would do is just like, you know, sort of you're uh, about to go off, uh, most people in the room are about to go off and start all, the, start all these things, join a company, start up, et cetera. What do you see as the role, uh, as the big trends, and then where do you want to play in it? Edit this, you know, sort of, you know, where, where is the, mo the, the most entrepreneurial need? Um, and, then, and then from my side, the sort of the personal journey, um, Stuart, Stuart said, you know, sort of talk a little bit about your business. And as I, as I said, I felt terrible because I thought I'm, I'm months behind you guys, uh, not, not ahead of you. But, but, but my point was then like, well, what are the biggest problems I can tackle? And you may have got, guessed it in terms of uh, the, the name of the company, but I thought, well, actually, the macro problem here that I'd love to tackle is time itself um, and, and, and the problem there. Um, and, and then we can solve climate change, but we can also solve some of the other problems that sort of everyone stays up, uh, up at night worrying about. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen the New Yorker cartoon, um, um, but this is, this, is a, this is a problem for I think many people, uh, maybe not ne yet if you're still in degree mode, but as soon as you get into the working world and, and, and you become known for something, um, then, then the demand on your time absolutely exceeds your, your possible supply to deal with it. Um, and, and it comes from, uh, I think, one of the biggest market failures there is, that sort of there's a fixed supply of the same number of waking hours we've had since we were created, um, and the same brain capacity. We can, we can fast switch, but we certainly can't multitask, and it's been proven rather than uh, disproved by new technology that, that that's what's happening. Yet on the demand side, the demand side has got absolutely crazy in the last few years alone. Um, if you take a few decades, we've gone from 3 billion people in 1960 to over 7 billion now on the way to 9 billion, so just more nodes to communicate with. Much more data, there's more data produced every year uh, than the cumulative stock of data ever. Um, we're much more connected, more devices, we're more than 100% connected. And the other interesting thing is if you're, if you're good at what you do now, it, there is no, there's no possibility in being digitally dark. Because even if you don't have an email, you know, the person that found you has taken a selfie and said, this is how you get to him, he's in this log cabin, and you just go around the corner, uh, and he's there. Um, and he's actually, he's actually as, uh, you know, as bad tempered as you think he might be if you found him without an email. Uh, but, but, but the key point there is, is that sort of, you know, sort of, it's impossible not to be found now in, in, in the technologies we've got. And so I felt this, I felt this whole piece 
going, geez, the, uh, in Carbon War, um, I've got this, so the, the guy, my, my, my founders, what, what, what's, what's, their, what's their problem like? You know, like, what's Richard's problem in terms of number of inbound in versus uh, how he's able to deal with it? And I think you guys have probably heard, I think there's a lecture theater that looks very similar to this with the vase of time, and somebody puts rocks in first, I've got a few nods, rocks in first, the big rocks of time, then your pebbles, they fit around the edges, then the sand fits around the edges, and then you can even pour a beer in uh, at the end. Uh, that's because you've, you've, you've managed time correctly, but if you put the sand in first, then the pebbles, you can only fit one rock in. Um, and the key point for me there was like, how can I help the world, but especially the top guys that are really solving these problems, deal with all the sand so that they can focus on the rocks. So that's time for good. I'm at uh, earlier stage than you guys. I'm prototype, I'm building. Um, I'm working with some very exciting people. Case study, for instance, say Richard Branson or Kofi Annan. Uh, Dear Mr. Annan, I really must get some of your time. Kind regards, the rising star. He gets thousands of those a day. He's got one person to deal with his mail. So he goes, dear sir, madam, that's great. I'm going to work on it, but I might not get there. Um, he get, they get, you get a private landing page. It's definitely Kofi or Richard or whoever. There's a little video apologizing for the, the inability to deal with it. But I do have, uh, I do have a little mechanism, a little charity raffle or a fixed price or an auction. I'll, I'll, I'll let the, them choose the market mechanism and the tone. Uh, it's all going to UNICEF. I don't keep a penny, but I love your ideas and, and, I'll, and I'll have them on Friday mornings at 10, please, because that's when I'm in the best mood to deal with one of your great ideas. Somebody goes, okay, I'll buy a charity raffle ticket. 70% of the dollar goes to UNICEF in this case for, for Kofi. I pick 20% because I want to get, uh, I, I get engaged in philanthropy myself. So 90% of the revenue is going to good causes. Um, and then I might get picked. If I'm in the green bucket, it's like, dear sir, madam, get ready. You're on with Kofi Annan and you're pitching and you need a 10 page PowerPoint because that's what he likes. Um, on the red, it's a softer than no which is, uh, thanks very much for donating to his favorite charity. Um, you're in the front three rows of his next New York speech. You have $10 off his next Amazon book voucher, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you're in the inner tribe, so there's no downside. Uh, and a triple win. Every request is responded to, so the leader goes home uh, with everything answered. Every rising star knows where they stand, and great causes are much better known and much better off. So that's, I, I wanted to push that to the end of the presentation because just I know it's, it's so uh, uh, early stage compared to some of the great business plans you've got, but that's what I'm trying to, ch trying to crack. Um, and and I, I just wanted to close there really on the sort of the layers of activity as you come out into the sort of, uh, you know, sort of out of academia and, and, and I know you already got bridges into the real world. As you settle in, it's like, well, where are the different th places I can operate? Um, I'm uh, obviously sort of in startup land there. I'm behind you. I need funding. I need uh, advisors, etc. cetera. Um, um, on the middle layer is like the job. Um, you know, sort of where are you going to have most impact? What are you going to do? What are you going to join? This is, this is just what I'm, I'm, I'm mucking around in at the moment. And then the other bit that I think was a really nice anchor for me when I got to Westport, and it actually just hit me sort of quite squarely when I got to Westport, and you know, to the extent I'd love to add Yale to this, to this line, is, 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 is the idea that sort of anchoring all the sort of things you're doing, if you're doing things on a global stage or a national stage, is to anchor something very local. So I just joined the Board of Trustees at Earth Place, for instance, which is 200 yards from my house. It's our nursery, our preschool, it's 80 acres of woodland, and they're a nature center, and it's like making sort of net zero happen at Earth Place and, and in the town of Westport, their Green Task Force, is as, as important to my learning as trying to get the B team, uh, Richard Branson's of this world, to thump the table and get into the Financial Times. Um, <clears throat> so just like thinking about those layers. So a last, and, and last, last sort, of t sort of thought, going back to that idea of the power of a collective voice in your own world, where I think the disruptive change is really happening is where there's unusual collaborations, where people in the same sector who are used to competing are coming together and saying, how do we solve the sector problem? Um, how do we solve a policy problem that's bigger than me? And I think, I think that's a really important point and something that I think is kind of a thread through all those different layers. So now what? Uh, last slide. Um, you know, sort of, I think if I was to sort of sum up what I sort of wanted to get across today is sort of, what are your opportunities? Um, you know, there's, there's tons of stuff on the left side of the cost curve, now the benefit curve. There's tons of profitable opportunities to solving, solving climate change um, and sustainability problem more generally and making money at the same time. Um, look at your mega trends, create your own mega trend list, work out where you sit in those trends. Work out your layers of activity. Don't just be confined, I think, to one layer of activity. You actually get benefit from working in the local, the, the, the regional, and the international at the same time. I, I, find, I find I learn a lot from each, each one. And then the power of the collective uh, to exert far more than you could ever do um, alone. 
why is my Angelo uh, in, in, in the, in the right-hand box, you might say? Um, she's got the best quote, I think, that sums this up uh, for us all today. So do your best until you know better, and when you know better, do better. Thank you, and now over to you. Thank you.